Here to add some context to the gaps and confusion of the police response in the shooting is Dr. Donnell Harvin, senior policy researcher at the Rand Corporation. He's also the former chief of Homeland Security and Intelligence. We're also joined by Jillian Snyder, director of criminal justice and civil liberties at the R Street Institute. In addition, she's a retired NYPD officer. Jillian, I want to start with you. There seems to be a lot of confusion about why it took so long for law enforcement to actually go into the school and confront the shooter. State officials now acknowledging that was a mistake. But Jillian, I wonder for you, if that was your team, what are you doing behind the scenes right now to figure out why that happened and to keep it from happening again? Well, in this situation, it appears that it was an active shooter. We know that. And traditionally, we know that we go in and immediately neutralize the threat. So active shooter situations are very different from barricaded suspect situations. Mm -hmm. And I think there may have been confusion there. But what the officers did was they responded to the scene from the timeline that I've seen thus far. It looks like officers did go into the school, but they didn't immediately engage with the suspect. And that might have been the issue. Um, the timeline is still confusing. Um, we're seeing developments every minute. It's only three days old, and I'm sure we're gonna learn more as we continue. Julian, clarify that for me. You're in the school and they can hear gunshots. Is it normal to wait for instruction, wait for more people? I think that's what a lot of people are kind of confused by. You're in there, you can hear what's happening. Why are we not engaging? Again, these are questions that I'm sure the answers will come out. I, I know from my training in the NYPD, I know procedure and protocol tells you if you're hearing gunshots and you have an active shooter, you go and engage immediately. Dr. Harvin, based off of what we know right now and the most recent timeline that we have, what do we, what, what do we know about when law enforcement followed procedure and where they fell short, if you had to put all of the actions we know about into those two buckets? Well, as Jillian mentioned, the timeline is still kind of unfolding. Um, I, as a former law enforcement officer, I'd like to give law enforcement the benefit of the doubt. However, it seems from everything I've seen, from the press conferences, from the timeline, from the statements, uh, that this is essentially a botched rescue and a botched takedown of an active assailant. Um, this assailant was shooting in front of the school for at least 10 to 12 minutes and then entered the school and started shooting. Uh, this is an active shooter scenario. It's not a hostage scenario. Uh, and as I was trained in the academy uh, and had to go back every six months to retrain in tactics in the tactical village in Washington, DC, it doesn't matter whether you're one person or four people. You don't wait for a SWAT team. You go in, you engage. Uh, if you take fire, you return fire. The other thing that could have been done is getting medics uh, either into the hot zone or the ward zone to start treating uh, some of these uh, the, and we'll have to wait to see what the medical examiner says some of these injuries uh, may have been uh, not life-threatening immediately but after an hour certainly we have the golden hour uh, it's even less uh, for pediatrics it's about 15 or 20 minutes uh, and so getting trained professionals in there in the, in the active warm zone or hot zone to either extract or start some critical trauma care um, is something that needs to be looked at as well. Yeah. Julian, based on your training, when first responders respond to something like this, who makes the call on what should happen and when? Is there one person in particular and how do you decide who that person is when you arrive? So if there's a supervisor on scene, they would immediately become the incident commander, the highest ranking person on scene. In a situation where you have two regular level officers, traditionally, and again, I can't speak to all agencies, but the senior officer would take charge. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Harvin, you know, we had a brief conversation with you before the interview. You said the protocol is to penetrate and hunt is the terminology there. Can you explain when that tactic is used and whether it may have worked in this situation or not? Well, we've learned a lot since Columbine and certainly since uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. And you, you just don't wait. Every minute that goes by, most of these active shooter scenarios are, are done within single digit minutes. And you just can't wait. You have to go in there. You have to engage with the assailant. Um, it take, if nothing else, you're taking their attention off of the innocent victims. And so once again, that's how we're taught. Jillian's spot on in, in terms of the, um, in terms of the uh, incident command. Uh, from everything that I've read, it seems like there was a miscommunication at the incident at the highest level, at the incident commander level, hmm. in, in understanding what the active threat was at the time. 
And so um, there's a lot to unfold. I think it's certainly a tragedy and, and you'll see a lot more uh, talked about, but the, letting this gentleman, uh, this person uh, engage with, with uh, innocent unarmed victims for an hour, uh, I don't need to wait for an investigation to, to tell you that that's not how it should have been, especially when you saw so many law enforcement officers outside preventing people from going in. Right, which state officials have also uh, acknowledged in the days following. Julian, we know that Border Patrol was involved. Can you explain why first responders from the state, local, and federal level all responded to this type of incident? What, what kind of call has to go out for that to happen? So an active shooter will immediately signal all law enforcement in the surrounding area to respond. Um, that's why you saw a multi-agency approach. I believe sheriffs were on scene, municipal agents were on scene. I think I saw U.S. Marshal was on scene as well as Border Patrol. So you have anyone that's available in the area. Whenever a police officer hears a call for an active shooter or a situation like this at a school or something involving young children or many victims, anyone that can hear that call will come running. And Dr. Harvin, as you know, we have all been careful enough to say uh, we're, we're going off of the information we have at this exact moment. It could change, you know, in 24 hours, 48 hours in a week, we expect it to, right? But after listening to what we know at this moment from Texas law enforcement, what questions do you think are still important to answer? Well, I just want to make a point on what you just said. Every every press conference seems to come up with you, you. We come out with more questions and answers, hmm. and so I'm actually even hesitant to talk about it today because I don't know what they're going to say tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, there seems to be some inconsistency, um, and so um, I, I'm going to take a, a kind of wait and see approach. Um, I think some of the questions that need to be answered are why was someone who was so heavily armed able to just walk into a school after shooting for 10 minutes in front of the school? Um, I, I also want to know why, uh, what, what was the shelter in place or evacuation alarm that went off inside the school, uh, how he was able to walk right in with the doors locked, um, what type of um, uh, capability did they have to shelter in place and lock doors internally. Uh, also like to know, uh, you know, what was the red flag um, possibilities in that county or in that state. Um, we've talked a lot about gun control and mental health. And so there's a lot of questions that need to be answered. Unfortunately, many of these children aren't even buried yet, so it's still yeah. early. Um, we do have to, to, to give some time to mourn uh, for the children, but the questions need to be answered. Absolutely. Dr. Donnell Harvin and Jillian Snyder, I wanna thank you so much for coming here and, and educating us and being willing to have this discussion. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.